Good morning. It is December 17th, 2020, African American Studies and instructor Mr. Townsend. Uh, so we're starting off with viewing checkpoint number two. Uh, checkpoint number two is now up. Um, so you need to define an abolitionist. You're going to name one of the abolitionists that we studied in class. And then you're going to take a stance on John Brown. Um, for our last class, do you guys remember about John Brown? And what we studied? Did we review John Brown last class? Yeah, because we watched the video. Okay, yeah, we watched a video about John Brown and how he was a very fierce abolitionist and didn't and didn't believe in the institution of slavery. Today we're going to um, we're going to discuss one of his advocates or one of his partners. And I don't have a formal lesson together, but I know enough about them to piece me one together. Um, let's just review John Brown real quick. So those that maybe weren't here or those who have to do the uh, checkpoint real quick, and then we'll go into Frederick Douglass. All right, so let me do share. Okay, this should be it right here. Okay, so for our last class, we talked about um, abolitionists. And so for your first checkpoint, for your set first question and your second checkpoint, if you wanna take a screenshot or write this down, this is gonna be the first question in your checkpoint. And what is an abolitionist? So an abolitionist is a person who favors the abolition of slavery of a practice of institution, especially capital punishment, and it used to be slavery. I think I have a, I don't know if we watched the one video on the abolitionists. Let me see if I can find that real quick. This should give you, um, so that first one for checkpoint. Can you blow it up, my fault. Can you blow it up? What's that? Can you blow up what you just had on the screen? Yeah, let me put it back. Let me put it back on. That that'll help you with um, checkpoint number two, question number one. Okay, let me make it bigger. Hold on. Let me um. Let me do the, the slideshow. Can you see that now, Quay? Is that big enough? Whoops. Yeah, I was talking about the definition. Yeah, I know. This stupid thing, trying to go back and forth. Come on. There we go. All right. So write that down. Um, if you have a pencil or a paper, um, this is going to be, this will help you with your, your second checkpoint question number one. What is an abolitionist? It's an abolitionist, a person who, who, they basically want slavery abolished. And the word abolish means to get rid of something, to remove it. So Zaire, um, Amir, write this down or take a screenshot of this because this is gonna be your question for checkpoint number two. And I would like you to have that done um, before we go into the break, which is five full days from now. So you have five days to do this. Quay, let me know when you're done writing that down. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Zaire, you got the definition? Yeah, 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 um, bro. I'm also going to put it in the, um, I'm also going to put it in the checkpoint. Why am I getting two different things here? Hold on a second. Okay, I'm putting it in a chat too.
So inside the chat right now, I put the definition. So in case you don't have it, you can go ahead and write it down. So let's look at a few minute video on abolitionists before we go into Frederick Douglass. We know all about John Brown, or mostly about John Brown. Okay, put this in here real quick. my video not playing. This is one of my video, hold on. Uh, copy. Is that not working? All right, I'm trying to pull up a video, but for some reason I'm having difficulty with it not translating over. Maybe that's the wrong hyperlink. Let's see if I can find it. Not sure if we watched that one or not. Just give me one second. My technology is not cooperating. Okay, I think we're gonna use this one right here. Um, give me a moment. Okay, so I'm gonna share this with you. So we're gonna start off with a video. <clears throat> um, Kalia, welcome, good morning. I see you come in. All right, we're gonna start off with a video just to give you familiarity with who Frederick Douglass was. Does anybody besides what we learned in class the other day know who Frederick Douglass was? Have we heard that name before, Frederick Douglass? Yeah. What was what 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 um what was he known for? He was um that's the black dude, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. Well then what we'll do is I want you for the video is to it's about seven minutes long. I just want you to name one important thing or something that you learned about Frederick Douglass from watching the video. He was a writer. I know that for, for a fact. Yes. He was a writer. He was an orator. He was what you could call basically the first civil rights, equal rights. Um, what's the word I want to use? Um, he was not the one that changed his name. Frederick Douglass. Um, Frederick Douglass, I don't think he changed his name per se. He may have. No, that's a my own. Are you talking about Malcolm X? Are you talking about Malcolm X? I don't know who said what. 
Uh, one interesting fact or tidbit from history that you did not know is that Frederick Douglass's father was a white man. Did you know that? Yeah. You didn't know that? Okay. So a lot of people did not don't don't realize that about Frederick Douglass. Um, Frederick, Frederick Douglass was another abolitionist. Um, he was born as a slave. He um, learned how to read through a series of different events in his life and became arguably to me one of the finest orators in, in human history. Um, he's someone I look up to. He is my screen. He's my screensaver on my personal laptop. And I live by his mantra. And his mantra is that knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. So an educated man is unfit to be a slave of any sort. So let's, let's look at Frederick Douglass. Um, cancel. All right. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay. So I want you to, when this video is over, I want you to tell me one thing that you learned about, it says right there, he's the greatest orators in American history, which is a consensus. An orator is someone who gives speeches. Uh, just tell me when you're done watching the video, give me one thing that you learned about Frederick Douglass. into slavery on the eastern shore of Maryland to a, an enslaved woman and to a white man and it was presumed that his enslaver was his father. He only saw his mother a handful of times his whole life and that's because she lived on a plantation that was 12 miles away. <laughs> slave mistress had never had a slave before and didn't know that it was illegal to teach him. Her name was Sophia Auld and she was teaching her young son Tommy his ABCs and there was Frederick standing right there eager to learn and that was all that he needed was that little spark of light into his mental darkness into his mental bondage. I'm asking you to make a donation right now to help flip Georgia and the Senate. Reverend Raphael Warnock September 3rd, 1838, he disguised himself as a sailor and with the help of my great, great, great grandmother, Anna Marie Douglas, whom he had met while enslaved in Baltimore. She was the first person in her family to be born free. And as they started to think about a life together, she was one of the first people to plant the seed of thought in his mind that Frederick, you're not meant to be a slave for life. And so at the age of 20, he runs away, he lands in New York City, he writes a letter back to Anna. She comes to join him and they get married on September 15th. natural gift for communication. He was eloquent. He was charismatic. He was theatrical and he was even funny. He was giving a firsthand account about the brutality that he had suffered, endured, and survived while enslaved. He was giving this firsthand account to the American public. And so the abolitionists understood 
that they had a star on their hands. And so they asked Frederick to join the Anti-Slavery Society as a paid lecturer. celebrity. That's the last thing that you want is the notoriety of a best-selling book if you're trying to hide from your, your enslaver. And so it was suggested that he flee to Europe for a couple of years as a cooling off period. And while he was in Europe, he, he talked about the abolition of slavery in the United States and he started gathering supporters. The abolitionist uh, paper, the North Star, was important because he could get his messaging out there and he could write, you know, he would write thousands of articles over his career. And really to be a black owner of a newspaper at that time was a big deal. <laughs> to be next. You too will marry a boy. In 1852, the Ladies Anti-Slavery Society invited Frederick Douglass to give a speech about Independence Day, and they invited him to do that on July 4th. Well, in protest, he gave the speech on July 5th. Frederick Douglass gave a scathing speech. He said, what to the slave is your 4th of July? And what he's saying is, how can you, how dare you ask me to come and talk about your high independence, to talk about your liberty? He said, this nation is guilty of crimes that would disgrace a nation of savages. President Lincoln had kind of a, a relationship that was um, back and forth. And there were times where he was very frustrated with President Lincoln and how slow he was to move toward abolition. But Frederick knew that the Civil War was about bringing down the institution of slavery. And so Frederick's importance during this time was he, he pushed Lincoln, he agitated. <laughs> Frederick Douglass was the first African-American nominated for vice president of the United States. He was the first African-American U.S. Marshal, um, first African-American ambassador and council general to Haiti, first African-American recorder of deeds in the District of Columbia, and the list goes on and on and on. said, I never want to look like a happy, amiable fugitive slave. And when you look at a picture of me, you're never going to deny that I'm a man worthy of freedom, worthy of citizenship. You know, I think that both parties in the United States political parties want to claim him, sometimes for better or for worse. 
um, if, in my opinion, you know, those that are on the right will look to the fact that he was a Republican, which he was. He had a quote, he said, you know, I'm a dyed in the wool Republican and I'll be a Republican for my whole life. But those of us that know our history here in the United States of the political parties know that the two parties, the Democrat and the uh, Republican party flip. And so it depends on who you're asking on what they get wrong about Frederick Douglass. Okay. So um, I know there's a lot of information there. Uh, it was pretty good uh, biography about his life. Um, so either in the chat or um, audibly, wake up, Quay. Wake up, Quay. Quay not sleep. Quay sitting here paying attention. Um, give me some, um, I know we just watched the video, it was about seven minutes long. I made some notes myself. Give me some facts that you did not know about Frederick Douglass before we watched the video. Or at least one thing that you did not know about Frederick Douglass. I didn't know him at, uh, Lincoln. I didn't know they were cool. Like, I knew of their relation, like, there was some type of relationship, but I didn't know that they was, like, cool. Okay. Um, I mean, cool is a is an adjective that you know you could use they they were acquaintances but um from my study of history abraham lincoln wasn't as quick to believe as everybody thinks that he was to free the slaves um so everybody thinks that president lincoln was this great emancipator because of the 13th because of the emancipation proclamation the document behind me uh but in reality he was actually kind of slow to um, get rid of the, to abolish slavery. Um, Zaire said he escaped slavery to become a public writer. Yes, he became a writer. Um, he became an ambassador. Uh, he became a U.S. Marshal. He was the first African-American to run for vice president. Uh, what else? What else did you learn from the video about Frederick Douglass that you did not know before? I can't really hear the part where he was talking about the newspaper. Okay, the newspaper was called the North Star. Well, you did. That's what I did. It was a publication that came out weekly, or I guess monthly during that time. Um, they probably couldn't make them weekly back then. And it was a pro-abolitionist paper. Um, and they would print articles that would basically appeal to those who were on the fence about abolition and about, about freeing the slaves. Um, he wrote a book at around 25. I mean, what you think is very, very young. He wrote a book at 25. Uh, what happened after he wrote that book? Where did he have to go to for a couple of years? Did you guys pick that up? He had to go to Europe for a couple of years because of the, the book that he wrote. I want to show you two things um, from Frederick Douglass. Sammy, I know you came in a little bit late. We were, um, we are discussing another abolitionist today, Frederick Douglass. Um, and we just watched a video with some of his accomplishments. Uh, Quay had said one, Zaire had said one. Um, his, Sophia Oud, Sophia Oud was her name. Um, she was the slave master's mistress. And she didn't realize that it was illegal to teach a black person or enslaved person how to read. Um, and like I said, now he says, knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. Why do you think, and this is just an opinion, why do you think that at that time they did not want black people or enslaved people to learn how to read? What would be the reasoning behind not letting them learn how to read? I'm going to take a good guess. I think because they didn't want them to grow up to be smart. And they could be something and stop slavery. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, very good answer. Because if we know something, if we have knowledge, then we have power, right? And if we keep the knowledge base away from a certain group of people, we can keep them not only physically enslaved, but mentally enslaved. And that philosophy has held in America for quite some time. It may not be illegal anymore to teach um, people of color or slave people or poor people how to read. Um, but like Zaire said, it is the empowerment of people. When they learn how to read, they learn how to do things. Um, in human history that I can't read and try to comprehend at least in my own understanding. Now, on the flip side of that, what book were they encouraged to read? What was the only book that they would let them read? Does anybody know that one? What you say? I said, what book would they let, what was the only book that they would actually truly let slaves read and understand? There was only one book, and they used this same book to control the Green Book. The what? No, that was for the traveling, right? Yeah, the Green Book was for the traveling in the 60s. That's correct. Oh, uh, but I don't know. The Holy Bible. That thing ain't holy. I'm not I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying that's that's what they called it. And they would use the Bible to teach people to, to accept their slavery. Because when the slaves were taken from Africa, when a group of people were taken from their homeland, you strip them of everything that they are. So most people in America, even though they have, good morning, Ahmad, even though they have a last- Chilling, we are talking about Frederick Douglass this morning. Um, and we're continuing about abolitionists. We're talking about right now uh, what happens when you remove a culture from its native homeland. So I know that we all have these last names, okay? And please don't take this as a disrespect to anybody because it's not a disrespect. Just hear what I'm saying. We all have a last name. My last name is Townsend. Um, that actually, I found out that my family were actually from, from Britain that they were a group of black bakers in, in, in Britain and the name is still popular there. But most people in America, not, let's say all people, like my grandmother's name is Jackson. I got cousins names who are Harris, Foster, Warren, all these surnames. The question, I guess, I'm not, it's not more of a question, it's more of a fact. These names are not our real names. So the names that you have at the end of your name is not really your name. Ask me how. Repeat what you just said. Oh, I want to know too. Okay. I want to make sure you said what you just said. The name that, like, your first name is Quay, okay? Now, that's just shortened of your mother's, the name that your mother gave you, right? Yeah. So our mother and fathers, they give us our first names, right? My mother did. My father ain't do Jack. Okay. Your, our mother or father or grandmother, someone, so someone gave Ahmad his name Ahmad, right? Someone gave his name Zaire, his name Zaire. Someone gave me my name Jaron. Someone gave you your name. I'm not going to say the whole thing. I know you like Quay, right? Yeah. But what I'm asking you is your surname, your secondary name, Walker, Stafford, Watkins, is that your name? Who gave you that name? Why, why? What's your view? It's a generational thing. <laughs> this goes back, trust me, this is going back to what Frederick Douglass is saying. Who gave you the name? Who gave you that last name? It's a family thing. I don't know. It's genetic. I don't know what you want me to tell you. Like, what? Okay, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna explain to you. Okay, so for real, for real, our first name is really our only name, right? Exactly. Because our moms made that up. Yes, you're right. okay. Why do you think that Malcolm Little changed his name to Malcolm X? 
Because he because him one of he because he made his last name. Because what does X stand for in algebra? What does X stand for in mathematics? The unknown. It stands for the unknown. Hey, yo, I just said that. I just said X stand alone. You just reworded the slave thing. I just said. It's okay. The reason that, that Malcolm X changed his name, he changed his name to El Haj Malik Shabazz. Okay? That was a name that he chose for himself. But in actuality, most Black Americans, we carry the name of the family that owned us. Yes. So let's say you were a slave and you came from Africa, but your real African name was taken from you. You don't know what your African name was. You don't know what tribe. You, you don't know what tribe you came from. So when you came to America, you were not only stripped of your culture, you were stripped of your name, your religion, your practices. Everything was taken from you. Everything. You have millions of people who are walking this continent that truly don't know who they are. These names are not our names. That's why you'll see people like everybody. Anybody ever heard of Kareem Abdul Jabbar? He was an NBA ba basketball player. Yeah, the ball player. His, his name was Lou Alcinder when he was born. He changed his name when he became Muslim. I know we've heard of Muhammad Ali, correct? Yeah. Well, his name was Cassius Clay. And Cassius Clay said, that is not my name. That is the name that was given to me by a slave master. Now, that's not universal. But in this country, it is. A lot of times, the names that we receive, and we're so far removed from them, hundreds and hundreds of years, that we have lost touch yeah, yeah, absolutely, Sammy, you was right. We lost touch with our culture and who we are as people. So a lot of the names, the only true name, if you believe historically like I do and other, other people who are academics, the only true name that you ever really have is the one that your mother gave you or your father gave you. But the surnames, we don't know what your true last name is. It has been lost to history. Just like, just like in this country, we have people who are Christians and Muslims and Jews. There ain't none of that in Africa. The only Christians in Africa were the ones who were converted when people came back to Africa and brought Christianity. As a slave, you were forced to be a Christian. There was no choice. Just like you were forced to work, you were forced to believe in Jesus. Islam comes from the Middle East. So there's a lot of black Muslim people today. But without slavery, that wouldn't exist. We would still be following the traditional African religions. So you have been uprooted from your continent and taken to a whole nother place and given a different name, given a different culture. How many people have seen Roots? I did, and that movie was long. It was long. Could the King, they got his foot chopped off. Because he kept running. Do you remember the, do you remember when the time when they were, when they were, they were, um, they were, they were whipping him and they kept asking him, what is your name? And he said, my name is Kinta Kunte. And he would tell him, no boy, your name is Toby. That's an example right there. He knew who he was. Kenta knew who he was. But when he was brought here, he was stripped of all those things of a man. See, slavery is not just a physical thing. It's a mental and psychological thing to be stripped of everything that you are as a human being. I mean, everything. Like jail is bad. But I would rather be incarcerated than be in slavery. Because at least in incarceration, I still have my own identity. 
in slavery, they took everything from you, everything. So during this time, they asked Mr. Douglas to come in and give a speech for women's empowerment, um, women's liberation. And it was supposed to be done on July 4th. And Frederick Douglass came on, he did it on July 5th as a protest. And I'm just gonna read some of it from you. But he said, what to the slave is the 4th of July? What does the 4th of July in this country symbolize? What do we do on the 4th of July? What are we celebrating? That's when independence was, uh, uh, hold on, let me get my words right before I touch on my stuff. Uh, that's when they, that's when the Declaration of Independence was right, when they declared that, uh, it was abolished, right? Or am I wrong? No, you're, you're correct. That was when the Declaration of Independence was signed. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. But who's, who's, when, when you, when you, um, when you have a 4th of July cookout and you put in food on the grill, and you, whose independence are you celebrating? Um, yours. Yours? You sure? Yours? I guess. I don't know. Did the, de did the Declaration of Independence free slaves? See, I don't have a cookout because I don't celebrate it. <laughs> you know? Okay. But I'm not talking about you in particular. I'm talking about. I know what I'm saying in particular. I'm about um, American, American culture. If you're, if you're American, we all go, most of us, most people in America have a 4th of July celebration, right? A 4th of July cookout. What are they celebrating? Who's independence? The American. Which American? Right. This America, what you mean? There was two type of Americans. Oh my God, the, this one, the one we living in right now, tells me, don't act like you're slow because you're not. Listen, <laughs> what I'm saying is, when independence was claimed, it was not for the slaves. It was for the white Europeans claiming independence from Britain. Black Americans didn't get freedom until the 13th Amendment, which was almost 140 years later. So we're celebrating the independence of the people that held us in oppression. The 4th of July is a celebration for a white man. There was no slaves being liberated on 4th of July. It was rich white Americans who didn't want to pay a 3% tax on tea. This whole country was started because of a 3% increase on taxes on tea. That's why they went to war. The same people who held other people in chains had no problem with holding people in chains, but didn't want to pay taxes. They were called the Intolerable Acts. So let's see what, what, what Frederick Douglass had to say about the 4th of July for a slave. I'm gonna just scan it to find the, uh, the most relevant. Okay, this, this is from Frederick Douglass's speech. And this is what I'm talking about. The celebration of the 4th of July is really nothing. It means nothing to a slave. So this, for the purpose of celebration, is the 4th of July. It is the birthday of your national independence and of your political freedom. This, to you, is what Passover was to the emancipated people of God. It carries your minds back to the day and to the act of your great deliverance and to the signs and to the wonders associated with that act and that day. This celebration also marks the beginning of another year of national life and reminds you that the Republic of America is now 76 years old. I am glad, fellow citizen, that your nation is so young. 76 years. Though a good age for an old man, it is but a mere speck in the life of a nation. Three scores and 10 is a lot of time for individual men but nations number the years by thousands. 
According to this fact, you are even now only in the beginning of your national career, still lingering in the period of childhood. I repeat, I am glad this is so. There is hope in the thought and hope in the much needed under the dark clouds which lower above the horizon. The eye of the reformer is met with angry fl flashes, portending that disastrous times. But his heart may well beat lighter at the thought that America is young and that she is still in the impressible stages of her existence. May he not hope that high lessons of wisdom and justice of, and of truth will give direction to her destiny. Were the nation older, the patriot's heart may be sadder and the reform, reformer's brows heavier. It is a future may be shrouded in gloom and the hope of its process go out, prophets go out in sorrow. So without orotating this whole thing to you, Frederick Douglass is saying, you're only 76 years old as a nation. And he said that the acts of America were more guilty of a crimes than that of a, of a civilization of barbarians. What type of human being could take another human being and hold them in a state of slavery and abuse them and beat them and hang them and rape them and kill them and have themselves and dare to call themselves a Christian nation? How? How could you call yourself a godly Christian nation when you hold other human beings in bondage? Can a, can a country be called a Christian nation that would take other human beings and hold them in a state of slavery? What do you think about that? Is it, a Christian, is it a Christian ideal to hold other people in a state of bondage? Has anybody ever been to Sunday school? I don't know what your religious beliefs are, but has anybody ever gone to church? This when I was before I turned to Islam. Yeah, I, my grandma used to make me. No, she used to make me when I was a young, young boy. She used to make me like get up and go. But then I had to learn like y'all doing all this. Like I came to a point at an age like I study all different religions, either even my own religion. So it's like. Um, you gotta, sometimes, I don't understand how you can be like, you can sit in face or somebody face and be hypocritical, like you're doing the same thing that that person is doing. And then when Sunday come, it's, oh, you're, you're, you're better than everybody or you're looking down at everybody. But you was just doing the same thing Monday through Saturday. So it's like, I don't know. They, I feel as though they hypocritical to me. That's any, that's just how I see it. And, and that's and that's a good that's a good opinion. Anybody else have any feedback on that? That's not just with that. It's, it's, it's with any religion for for real. Because I know some sisters and brothers that's Muslim that they judge, but we're not supposed to judge nobody for for real. We're not if you look at it. No, we're not. Thank you, Quay. So hypocritical. Um, when we watched John Brown video the other day, he was talking about a nation of hypocrites. How you could say, love thy, the Bible says things like, love thy neighbor as thyself, right? One of the top commandments is thou shall not kill, right? You have all these things that, now just as a, not as an individual, but as a nation, that the United States says, we are one nation under God, right? But how could, you, how could you believe in a God that loves everyone and says, treat thy neighbor as thyself and all these other moral ideas and keep a whole race of people enslaved? I mean, imagine this. I mean, Frederick Douglass, his father more than likely raped his mother. which means when slaves were held, they would have slave housing. And it's well known that many a nights, the slave master would come down to the slave quarters and be with the slave women. 
It was very known. So a lot of people were born out of, some people were born out of love, but a lot of people were born out of forced, some of their mothers being forced to have intercourse with these slave masters. And that's what I was talking about. Slavery just is, is a, it's a terrible institution from top to bottom. It takes over every aspect of your humanity. It actually strips you. What's that? I agree because when all this stuff started happening, like COVID and discrimination, police brutality, like they start coming out with movies, like they start bringing Harriet Tubman up, uh, all these black people that got committed for crimes that was that didn't see justice, stuff like that. They start bringing all that to movies and stuff, mm -hmm. basing it on true stories. And, why and they tried to say that God wasn't listening to black people. Like when they pray, they tried to say that he don't listen to niggers. That's what they tried to say. Wow. That's a, um, that's a heavy thought there, Kalia. That's a heavy thought. And, and this is what, and I mean, I know Quay, she says she identifies as a Muslim. And these would, if you were in my other class, these were the people who were saying, how much longer do we have to, what kind of God are we praying to that won't free us? What type of God are we crying out to for justice when there's no justice? There's, a, there's an old saying that says, there's no justice, it's just us, just us. No justice, just us. So to be reaching out, whether you're in slavery, whether you're having things going on now and say, I'm reaching out to, you know, even Frederick Douglass's life and John Brown, John Brown was it was it all he did was quote scripture. And he decided that even in all his studies of scripture that slavery at its core was an evil, evil institution. When we studied Nat Turner, that statement at the end said evil begats evil. Like John Brown said, the only way that this country will ever be free of slavery was with blood. And I think that that blood continues to spill today. I read a story yesterday about a police sergeant who tracked down a man and held him at gunpoint because he thought that he was carrying illegal ballots to the, to the polls in his mind. So this person's going to do 20 years in jail because he thought something was going on. We know historically that slavery happened. There's no denying it. There's no getting away with it, no getting from it. And most people, what do they tell us about 9-11? I know you guys are young, but what, what's the motto with 9-11? What do they say about 9-11? Never what? You said the motto? Yep, for 9-11, when the, when the uh, towers were knocked down. Yeah, when it was hit. They always tell us to do what? Never look back? I don't know. Never forget, right? I'm about to ask you. I put it in the chat. They tell us never to forget. I ain't even gonna hold you to I was a youngin', so I don't even remember. I know, I was 26. <laughs> so yeah, I go ahead. I'm an old head. That's all right. That means I made it. Um, they tell us to never forget 9-11, which was 19 years ago. They tell us to remember the Alamo, which was in 1860. But any time a person says, what about slavery? The first response is, oh, that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. That don't got nothing to do with it now. If I would have a dollar for every time that a Caucasian person has told me that slavery does not have an effect on modern society, I'd be rich. The civil rights movement didn't start till 1968. I was born in 1977. It's not that far off. What, what's your race? My race is human. Are you asking me what my cultural identity is? Well, yes. My father, 
My father is a black man and my mother is German. Okay. So I am Frederick Douglass. <laughs> um, I, quite, I, I don't know any, I was born in the okay. 70s. Um, I never had a, um, an African American hist like history teacher. Oh, well, I'm, when I was a kid, I had a big fro. When I was in my 20s, I, had, I come from a large black family. Um, I really don't know much about Caucasian life per se, um, because my mother is not really American, if that makes sense. Um, but I have never culturally identified as, you know, people say these things like mixed, melodic, whatever. Um, I, don't, I don't know anything else but black. I just don't. It was just the way I was raised. My dad was- so like, question. Well, honey. Cut you off. But did she, did your mom have to get a like, uh, when she came over here, did she have to get a, a green card? Just no, she was, she was second generation. So my, my grandparents came and she was born here. So she didn't have to, oh, right. but her culture was still German. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But she wasn't, she wasn't raised here. My mother's not like, um, my mother's not like an average, uh, that, that's okay. Um, my mother's not an average um, white woman, let's put it that way. My grandfather moved into the projects in the 1950s and he didn't care much about color. So my mother and my father were, they actually lived next door to each other when they were kids. And they were best friends at 10 and they were married for 46 years. So I am the byproduct of my, my mother and my father's relationship. Does that help? Here, quick. I have an actual, there you go. See that? That's my father and that's my mother. My father passed away a few years ago, unfortunately. Uh, so um, we got about three minutes left in class. So these, uh, these, uh, this idea of the abolition of slavery, the orientation of Frederick Douglass, it just shows that, I mean, this is a man who ran for vice president before people even had their rights in this country um, as black people. And so I use him as, a, as someone to look up to. Uh, we're going to um, finish next week with Harriet Tubman. So all three of them kind of go together, John Brown and Frederick Douglass. And I also wanted to do, I was trying to pull it up, but I could not find it. I didn't have time. Um, something about the photo, I want to, there's a very interesting segment about photographing and Frederick Douglass. Um, like you said, he was, he was um, accredited with making the modern selfie. Uh, but we will continue, today is Thursday. So I think literally, is next Tuesday the 22nd? Are we off? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm with you on that one. So I don't even think we're going, I don't even think I'm going to see y'all next Tuesday. We won't see you back until the 4th. To the 4th. So do your checkpoints. Do your checkpoints over the break. And if you need me, just um, here. If you need me over the break, this is my cell phone number down the bottom. That's my cell phone number. So if you need help with any of these checkpoints, even though I'm not working, I will be available. Okay. So do your checkpoints. They're up in summit. They're due before the break, which is five days. So do I have any questions? Yes or no? Yeah, how many are there? How many checkpoints are there? Yeah. Well, there's two up. The first one we did was Jim Crow, and the second one is abolitionist. All right, that's the only one that need to be done? Yep, it's checkpoint number two. Then when we come right. back, we'll start on checkpoint number three. They're both up there? What's that, Zaire? They both up there? Yep, they're up there. They're on summit. Oh. And, and matter of fact, the PowerPoints are up there. 
The article is up there. Everything you need is up there. But if you need my help, use that telephone number. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for staying awake, Quay. I appreciate your input. And uh, uh, I hope you guys were able to learn something this morning about Frederick Douglass. And I know I got off on a little bit of things about, you know, slavery and, and religion, but all that ties in together. Um, so I will see you guys on the fourth. I think we have a, I think we have an assembly on Friday. I'm not sure tomorrow, but I'll send you an email if we do. Okay. All right. All right. Y'all have a good day. Zaire, take it easy on the game. Don't shoot everybody. Uh, bro, I'm on Fortnite now. Oh, oh you're on Fortnite? Um, yeah, I got a Call of Duty. Yeah, I got I to I gotta get that Mandalorian armor. That's the only reason I want to play Fortnite. I like the Mandalorian. Oh, we got that, John. Oh, you got it already? I'm mad about that. All right, I'll get it later on. All right, you guys have a good day.